Okay, thank you very much. And uh, well, first, thank you very much um, for all to the previous speakers because they uh, have said already all the technical details and even much better than uh, I could do, could have done uh, on the uh, optical, on the self mixings. And of course, I'm here on behalf of the first author, uh, our postdoc, Francesco Mezzapesa. So I will not, uh, I decided not to give too much technical details, but try to, um, let's say, to, to push one idea that I have about the future possibility of the development of this uh, um, technology. So traditionally, uh, self-mixing has been used uh, over the past 30 years for uh, measuring displacement, velocity, vibration, amplitude, distance, and also material characterizations like deformation, refractive index measurements, thickness and surface softness of different materials, as well as, as was mentioned before, to measure some uh, the para a few parameters of the, especially uh, laser diodes, uh, namely uh, the, the laser line width and the Henry factor. And of course, uh, limitation has been, uh, uh, let's say, pointed out during these years, uh, and uh, let's say against uh, the, the use of self-mixing as, a, as a, a substitute of a standard interferometer. And there's this, the missing, uh, the, the lack of a proper reference arm, a poor stability of the diode lasers uh, with respect, for example, their tuning capability, the tuning dependence of the, um, of the laser wavelength with respect to the current, the driving current, the extremely high sensitivity to the feedback level that, uh, that has been shown especially by diode lasers and uh, uh, the limited configuration flexibilities that uh, the, the single arm interferometer would eventually uh, have with respect to the standard measures of interferometers. A few of these limitations have been already addressed and we, and we have seen that is not so, they are not so strict, it's, possible, it's quite a flexible system. And uh, I will move a bit further and uh, I will address, address a few of these issues uh, in, in the in next slides and to see how these things can be possibly uh, overcome by using a different kind of, uh, different class of lasers and uh, also different kind of configurations. So let's say my, I will talk about, I would, I like to call it new horizons for optical feedback, which means that uh, choose different kind of laser sources with improved stabilities, the adoption of uh, a dynamic reference arm for that would eventually provide an increased or improved resolution and not only resolution, and uh, new application uh, in materials analysis and biomedical photonics. And uh, so most of you are probably familiar with this uh, um, configuration graph, and this configuration graph is just Okay, sorry, this was just one click too early. And uh, this configuration graph is just the, the plotting the, the, the different stability regimes of the diode lasers with respect to the, let's say, the feedback delay, which is uh, here represented by the distance of the target from, from the laser source. And uh, these two diagrams are separated uh, 30 years apart and about uh, uh, 5 microns in wavelengths because this is... Uh, for 1.5 micron laser in the in the 80s in the 80s, and this is one very recent result by the group of uh, Professor Guillot, and it is a, for a mid infrared quantum cascade lasers. They look quite similar, although they are not so similar. If we look and on the same scale, if we look on the same scale, we see that uh, this kind of regimes actually occur at a much higher feedback level than with diode lasers. So. Quantum cascade lasers are, let's say, intrinsically more stable than uh, diode lasers. And uh, the reason for this is really uh, twofold. The first one comes because of the photon, carrier, the, the photon carrier lifetime ratio in quantum cascade lasers is much higher than in diode laser. And, and okay, just I switch the, okay. And this will give, uh, this gives, uh, gives us about one order of magnitude improvement in the stability of the laser. And then the other order of magnitude, or so a bit more of this, comes before of the line width enhancement factor of the diode or the quantum cascade laser is much smaller, is close to zero as in uh, solid state lasers. And uh, we see here that by decreasing, okay, by decreasing the line with enhancement factor while keeping the same 
carrier to lifetime ratio, then uh, the, the, the value, the feedback ratio by which the system becomes unstable, reaches the first threshold instability, becomes much, much higher. At the end, uh, for an alpha factor which is smaller than two, which is typical of Terra's quantum cascade laser, we call this region, let's say, ultra-stable. Ultra-stable doesn't mean that it's impossible to destabilize, but it means that it cannot be, uh, let's say, studied in the framework of the Lange Kobayashi uh, model. So <coughs> what can we do with this, uh, let's say, increased stability? One thing is that, of course, we have much more flexibility in using the, uh, the feedbacks. It's not that we are, li we are limited to some particular value. We have, to, we have to take care that this value is always in the same range. So th let's say that uh, one first thing, just to use two different feedbacks, and I will show you later how it, how it can be done. And uh, so we here have uh, uh, the possibility of using two different uh, feedback ratios and also two different time delays. The time delays can be, let's say, implemented either by putting the two targets at different distance or by moving them at different velocity. It doesn't really make a, a huge difference. So, of course, when the feedback rate is, is relatively low, we are in a linear regime, and they, which means that in the Fourier uh, spectrum, we observe the two independent, these are two targets that are moving at different speeds, and uh, we see the features uh, in the in Doppler um, frequency shift that are related to the two individual speeds. Of course, if we increase the feedback ratio, we enter into a nonlinear regime, into this, that, what we call the nonlinear regime. In the nonlinear regime, also features appear at the sum and different uh, components of the, of the different velocities. So in the Fourier spectrum, we have uh, the sum and the difference uh, frequency, and at still higher frequency, at still higher feedback rate, we had set into a, a, a regime that we call highly nonlinear regime, where the main peak is always the one at the difference or the sum frequency, or, or, the, sum, uh, or the sum of the two frequencies, and it is pretty much stable, and uh, he is always the main peak irrespective of the feedback rate. Okay, so this is what we have done in the, in the laboratory, and uh, we, have, we are just putting a set on the beam splitter. This is a quantum cascade laser at 6.2 microns, so it is a mid infrared laser. And uh, uh, just uh, moving the two targets at different speeds, we recover this kind of signal. And uh, I would just mention before going on that uh, although we are using this, let's say, um, prototypical experiments, in principle, really, there is a, a huge flexibility in designing the way in which your reference arm can be designed. You can really change the speed, the position, the orientation, the transmittance, uh, the oscillation vibration of this one, and then you will possibly enable different kind of measurement schemes. So coming back to our, our first experiments, uh, is that uh, uh, you can clearly see here that there are two fringes superposed on the same track. One which, is, uh, which corresponds to the, to the dis displacement of the, the, the slow target, and the other one which, is, uh, uh, which corresponds to the displacement of the fast targets, fast moving target. And in the Fourier uh, spectrum, you can clearly see both the features of the, uh, the constant, the, the, the target that was moving uh, at the constant speed, plus the sum frequency with the, uh, that correspond to the sum of the two velocity, where the other target was moved with different speeds. This happens both in opposite direction and in the same direction. Okay, this is what we expected. But uh, the idea behind it is that uh, here you see that the displacement of the, the slowly moving target is actually sampled at a much higher spatial frequency, which belongs to the speed of the, of the fast target, which is the, our, what we call the reference arm. So, and if we have a closer look at the, at the, the, the this kind of signal that we get, we see that uh, with some particular uh, configuration of the two feedback rates, I'm not going to get into the detail now, 
but uh, there is even more information inside of the fringes, uh, not just the two that I've shown before. And if we, have a, if we make an analysis of this signal, we are able to sample the displacement of the second target one we are looking at with the resolution, which is about lambda over 60. And uh, lambda over 60 is not, let's say, huge. It, it, it's a good number. It is not, uh, let's say, heaven. But uh, uh, simulation will tell us that uh, the, the achievable resolution actually becomes, uh, belong, uh, depends mostly on the ratio of the two velocities, and uh, there are only few limitations. These numbers here is 10 to the 8, which means that uh, the, uh, in principle, the number that here is 60 can be 10 to the 6th, okay, with not particular effort. Uh, I, well, I'm not saying that I'm, we are going uh, to, to make a, an Angstrom ruler, but possibly a nanometer ruler, it would be possible to, to, to do it just with, and remember that these are mid-infrared wavelengths, okay? So we are, we are paying a, a, a bit in terms of the, the a longer wavelength with respect to the uh, diode lasers. So let me go on and see if uh, we can extend this, uh, this, this concept of the, of the uh, dynamic reference arm in between, which is not in between the, 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 the laser source and the target, which is not a new concept. I mean, this is common path interferometer that has been proposed by different groups, even by the group of our chairperson a few years ago. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not telling any, any, anything particularly new, but I think that there is large room for, for let's say, uh, inventing new technologies, new way of uh, new ways of, of using this technology. Let's, so uh, this is some, uh, uh, this is just a few ideas that are really open that I would like to discuss with the people eventually interested in. Uh, and this is, let's say, uh, correlation spectroscopy. Correlation spectroscopy uh, can be done if we use a, a, a spatial light modulator instead of a uniform uh, sampling being split in between. I'm not going to tell you that I know how to do it. I'm just tell you that uh, in principle, for me, it can be done, okay? And uh, optical coherent tomography. We have already have seen one confocal implementation of this technology in the first talk. So, and uh, if we just use uh, in, in the standard, the traditional uh, optimal uh, OCT configuration in the time domain, so if we use um, a, a longitudinally uh, moving uh, mirror put just half way in between the, the, the laser source and the sample, we are going to measure the different thicknesses, then we will get a double refraction from this one. Any, any, uh, we, will have, we'll, we will have an announcement of the signal any time that a double refle path reflection from this target will equal the one reflection from any of the surfaces in the sample. And uh, I would like also to suggest more things. And one is the photoacoustic tomography, which in principle is not too far from this uh, synthetic aperture radar that was shown uh, on, on the previous slide, on the previous talk, on the first talk. And uh, if we have uh, an absorbed part of the light that will create uh, let's say a pressure wave or a thermal wave, then it would be possible to use with the, pretty much the same principle using a swinging target to get information about the different K vectors that are uh, reflected or in this case scattered by the, uh, the sample at different angles. And uh, one more, mid-infrared optical staining uh, now that are, um, are commercially available from the daylight solution, for example, broadly tunable medium infrared quantum cascade sources. And uh, if we use um, a, an electrically tunable filter in between, we could select which kind of the wavelength is going to be reflected back into the laser. And so we have, uh, uh, and so to have uh, in, uh, let's say, in reflectance mode, okay, in closing, fine. And so there are a few more things that I, I mean, I would like to discuss, but the end, uh, the, 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 the dream of this, uh, of this challenge would be just to have 
a different kind of modules based on the optical feedback interferometer that can be eventually fiber coupled to a switch, a switch with a different dynamic reference arms, and they are eventually we can also put uh, in, in, in series a scanner like the one um, shown on the, previous, on the first talk, and to actually measure something uh, then in um, for bio biological applications would, uh, would be uh, an in vivo investigation. So I will skip the, the conclusions, and uh, I apologize to the digression from the subject matter of this topic, so if there was someone that was get into this room just to know about the different velocities would be it is being probably <laughs> shocked, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.